Hey everybody, welcome. This is just going to be a friendly little chatter with my good friend, uh, Shane the Runer. Um, this is not like a regular formal show. Shane was just with me not too long back on Strange Mosaic, but we had a few things pop up uh, during that conversation that we thought we'd make a separate video about. And so um, we're gonna talk about that here and that's gonna be uh, some issues related to uh, diet and mind control and both how it can contribute to mind control and also how it can help you to evade or break some of it. Um, so we're going to do that uh, here sort of for the public YouTube video and then we're going to move over to the patron section and have a little chat about some of Shane's new work. And Shane, how you doing? Wonderful. Awesome. I like your damn paradise. No, absolutely. I don't know how anyone could think this is anything other than that. <laughs> <laughs> I like your shirt. I, I wore it for you because you said that before. Yeah. Uh, on one of the last, the last time I wore it, I guess, on a video. Yeah. It, so I, I was like, oh, I'll wear this one. Yeah, I like that one. It's kind of like, it has like a Stranger Things vibe. Well, you can really see it. It's got the singer from In This Moment on it as well. Oh. This thing that she does, it's like kind of like Pan's Labyrinth, if you've ever seen that. Huh. I didn't, I, I guess I've only seen the top part of the shirt. And I kind of thought about, like, it has sort of a Stranger Things vibe to it, right? And so, of course, there they have the upside down, right? That would imply that this is the right side up, which I don't know if that's the truth or not, but there's definitely an in-between space that, <laughs> that I've watched that I know you have, and I'm like, oh, it's kind of like that. <laughs> but it's sort of the, the, um, the tenet of so-called reality, right? Have you, seen that? have you seen anything with the new movie Tenet? Any no, actually, I don't even think I've watched the full trailer for it, to be honest. I know I'll watch it because I'm the director and the writer, um, I watch everything that they do, but I, I yeah, haven't really paid much attention yet. So it's, it's basically like there are two parallel realities that where time runs the opposite direction in each one of them. And then there's like a zone sort of between, like where they can cross over, right? And, and where there's started sort of some melding. So basically, like I haven't seen the movie yet, but from the trailers, it's kind of like based, okay, so if you're working, if you're in a timeline where time is traveling backwards, right? And, and we're, like, we think of ours as tra traveling forward. So if somebody was in another space where it was traveling the opposite way, we think of it as backwards. But that, that would mean that things that haven't happened here yet have already happened there, right? So by coming over to this side, they can get out in front of them, right? And either stop them or change them, like be ready to, catch the bullet or something like that instead of having hit whatever it is, right? But it also seems to create, you know, various kinds of anomalies and then this sort of space in between and the way they cross over seem to be interesting and whatnot. Like, you know, it's a lot of, there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> I think there's a lot of uh, that going on with the various things we experience, but yeah. It reminded me immediately of some snow globes I was recently explaining. Yes. We'll talk about later. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, so I wanted to kind of talk with you a little bit about diet because I know that like you earlier, you know, earlier this year and, and myself as well, we're kind of experimenting with the uh, carnivore diet. And I also know that you sort of go in and out of doing it as I do. So I kind of wanted to talk to you because if you talk to somebody who is full on carnivore diet, like you get a very particular perspective that isn't in any way like reflective necessarily or... Um, or, you know, like neutral and how you're assessing it, right? And then if you talk to somebody who's like a vegan or opposed to the carnivore diet, right, you obviously get another version. And the same thing goes for if we're talking about veganism, which we may talk about a little bit as well. But when you kind of go in and out of, for me, I've been sort of using it as like a tool or like a baseline kind of thing. And so because I have time away from it, like I feel like I, have a different angle on it, and I'm assuming you do too, and we haven't really talked, I haven't really talked about it with anyone from that perspective yet. Um, so did I, am I right about what you're doing with it? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I started in January where I went full for the whole month. At the mm -hmm. end of the month, I just decided I was gonna like, you know, break it, and that made me feel really shitty, so I didn't continue breaking it, I went back to it. And now what I do is like, I do it, I mean, I don't, I don't buy and cook anything else besides meat. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if I'm out somewhere and someone offers me something, I will, you know, probably eat it. Or if it's free and it's in front of me, or you know, if it that kind of thing, maybe I might eat it. And you know, sometimes if I get a craving for 
something that's not carnival, I will, I will have it. But uh, for the most part, I, I just found that I stick to doing it because my body likes it. I enjoy it and I want it. And mm -hmm. um, I've tried, like I've, I've been vegetarian. I've gone full vegan. It just didn't last very long. Um, mm -hmm. I've been everywhere in between. Started with the keto thing. And that's where I, I got interested in the, the carnivore thing was because I started hearing a lot about I've had a lot of injuries for a lot of different reasons and mm -hmm. I've had a lot of inflammation because of them, arthritis problems, things like that, um, nerve damage in places. So I, I had heard that, you know, people with those problems were, were finding like, you know, uh, healing or like curing some of those problems. Whereas what I noticed when I went uh, vegetarian fully, those all got a lot worse. Mm -hmm. like I started to like actually like hurt more and, and be in a lot more pain and have a lot less energy, um, despite the fact that I was getting everything that I needed. And so I, I stick to it now kind of very loosely. I mean, it's not a, not a rule. It's just what I like now because it makes me feel the best. And um, again, if I feel like breaking it for a day, then I'll break it for a day. Or if I, I you know, I'm offered, I, I don't like turning down food when I'm, it's offered to me. There's a, mm -hmm. a weird, energy thing that goes on in my head when, <laughs> whenever I have to do that. So I do my best to accept it. So if it's at least something healthy, I'll, I'll, I'll eat it if it's not me. Yeah. So that's, it's very similar to sort of what I've done. Like I've been vegetarian. I was vegetarian for a very, very long time. Also vegan for a shorter time because that was really difficult to to maintain, but none of, and then I've done paleo, keto, candida, every diet you can imagine. And so for me, it was kind of a combination of, I was having some struggles with my body that I hadn't had before and none of the usual tools that worked seemed to be addressing it. And people had been asking me a lot about the carnivore diet, which I had initially a couple years ago when it first became popular, poo-pooed it, right? And kind of like, that's ridiculous. But, um, you know, over time, like kind of, become a little more curious about it and people were asking me more and more about it because I do nutrition consultations and all that kind of stuff. So I just decided to try it and did it just exactly like you. Like I went like full force for like several months actually pretty much like where I was eating nothing but meat and like eggs and stuff like that. Um, except for one day a week I was uh, eating whatever, one, one meal a week I was eating whatever I wanted because I did know from my nutritional stuff that um, the ability to digest a variety of foods is an evolutionary advantage and an adaptation and all of that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to lose that. And also because I enjoy eating fancy food and I didn't want to set myself up for like, yeah, this isn't gonna work. I wanted to give myself the best chance to really experience it. And I had all the same um, things happen with me that people who didn't do that, like who just went full on carnivore and didn't give themselves any you know, other stuff at all. I had seemingly all those same experiences. So I don't think the one meal was enough to sort of alter that or shift that. And I did that pretty hardcore for like three or four months. And then I went on a trip and I started being a little bit more like, okay, like I do it during the week and not always on the weekend or kind of like what you're talking about, like if I'm eating out or with some other people. And then once in a while, like I just get tired of it. Like I feel like I need something texturally else. So for a couple of days until I'm feel like I've satisfied whatever, you know, dissatisfaction I've had, I'll just kind of eat whatever and then I'll go back. And I kind of refer to it as like a lot of people are on a plant-based diet. And for some people that means vegan, but for others, it just means they eat mostly plant-based food and they occasionally like, you know, supplement that with meat. For me, it's the other way around. I'm eating mostly animal-based foods and occasionally I'll have some other things. So it's like between an 80 and a 90 percent, you know, kind of thing for me. And I find that works pretty well. Do you, when you're doing carnivore, do you drink coffee with your carnivore diet? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, coffee with cream. Like I don't, uh, I don't do the sugar thing, but definitely the cream and the coffee. And I'm a coffee addict. I drink coffee and water. That's pretty much all I've ever yeah. drank. I'm trying to stop myself just because of the overdosing on caffeine every day. But um, still, yeah, coffee and water. That's my my go-to. Yeah, yeah. No, for I mean, I I've been doing coffee for it as well. Like I've been curious about like if I decide to experiment any deeper with the carnivore diet in terms of like I think. It's a little, I can go about a week with just eating beef and nothing else, right? But, but then you start to get the textural boredom. Um, and so I don't do that too much. I mean, I eat raw fish sometimes. I'll eat 
other kinds of seafood, other kinds of meats and whatnot. But, you know, if I, if I were going to do like a, a month of like playing with another iteration of like a really strict carnivore diet, I think I'd try it with removing the coffee just to see like how, how that goes. Um, but yeah, I had noticed the same things as you with particularly with the vegetarian and the vegan diet and stuff like that. Like I also have a lot of those joint and nerve kinds of injuries and I was just always uncomfortable in my body and always tired. And um, that is definitely not the case with the, uh, with the, car with the carnivore diet. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's amazing. Like I, I've had a lot of sleep issues in my life for many different reasons too. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's actually helped with that quite a bit. It's, and, and it's really strange because I wake up in the morning and although I love coffee, I don't need coffee to wake up, I'm just awake. And then for the whole day, I've got that same level of high energy. Like I can go to the gym, I can work. I've been going to the gym for eight hours and then work. I can tell you've been going to the gym. I've been noticing your biceps in the last couple of videos. I can see them now too, looking good. <laughs> and uh, you know, I can, I can do all of that. And then at the end of the day, when I go to, go to bed, like it's, it's nighttime and I need to sleep for whatever reason, but I'm not really tired. I'm just, I, I feel good. I'm all right. If I needed to do something, I could, but it's bedtime. So I'm going to go to sleep and I can go to sleep really kind of odd. And the only times that I have the insomnia come back or when, you know, I, I fuck that up by eating a bunch of ice cream right before I go to bed or something stupid. Right. Yeah. Uh, anytime I go off of it, I, I can feel the change and it's not even just a digestion thing. It's, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah how my body is processing the energy from that food is different. Yeah. And, um, I mean, energetically, there's obviously there's a lot to be said for eating plant-based food because there is a lot of available bioenergy there, a, a lot of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your body can take all of that either, mm -hmm. which is something to consider. It's like the amount of, you know, you can take, a hundred milligrams of this vitamin or 50 milligrams of this vitamin but if your body can only take 25 milligrams at a time then it's only going to take 25 milligrams at a time it's you know the same thing with like saying smoking weed you can't get so stoned that you overdose because there's a certain percentage of your blood that can be you know toxified by the the thc and therefore you can only get so high as it is yeah and the same thing goes on with food and on a carnivore diet it's the same thing like you don't if you overeat meat, you'll kick yourself out of ketosis because your body starts processing it as carbs anyways. So it's like your body knows what to do with what you're putting into it. I personally think through all of my experimentation that we confuse the hell out of our bodies by continually changing it. You know, like I think it's good to change and have some change, mm -hmm. but I think that change should almost be on a cycle, like uh, yep. almost like, you know, you let yourself go for a while and then you use you know, adapt to something new for a while. That's how I, I kind of rotate through my meat sources now. Like I'll eat beef for three days, or arbitrarily three days. I'll eat chicken for three days and I'll eat pork for three days or, or you know. Yeah. Uh, that's not actually how I do things. It's usually ch chicken and beef and I eat pork it with it anyways. Cause I just cook bacon with everything I make because it's just <laughs> free fat, right? And it tastes great. So um, anyways, uh, that, it's like anything else, like working out, like training for gymnastics or martial arts, whatever you're doing, you need that repetition, right? Your yeah. body requires that repetition. It needs some form of routine in order for it to, you know, adapt and, and actually use, utilizes the changes that occur when you're making changes, right? Like if you suddenly switch your diet, it's going to take some time for that diet to catch up with your lifestyle, your body mass, your um, the way your body's functioning, all of that, it doesn't just happen overnight. You have to have some discipline and some routine and practice it for a while. And so a lot of people will jump on a diet, be like, oh, I'm three days in, I don't feel anything, so I'm just going to go to McDonald's. You know, <laughs> and, and that's, that's not the right attitude. You have to have discipline to uh, experiment with these things. And I think everyone should because, you know, we're, we were taught way incorrectly right from – the very beginning and we know that now right like it's, it's a million documentaries out there can show you that now whether it's pro vegan or whether it's pro meat it doesn't really matter it's still going to show you that the way that we were taught from the beginning was the worst right so let's not do that yeah so we, know, we know at least that much so why don't you just try each way right and um see how your body reacts give yourself your 
proper amount of time to adjust to it so that you know how your body is actually reacting and then make an informed decision as to what you would like to do from there for your own well-being. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other discussions to have when it comes to food and food sources, but I think when it comes down to like what's actually good for your body, that's going to vary from individual to individual and you're going to have to do some experimenting to find out and you know the carnivore thing was never really you know, ever since we had the the pyramid of food we haven't really ever seen that until just recently <clears throat> whereas like vegetarianism veganism came out almost right away or was al always there anyways the carnivore thing was really only a circumstantial thing like certain tribes where we had access to meat yeah like, like an eskimo eskimo thing <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So now that we have, you know, uh, we've come to a place in our, our world where we can, you know, readily get things and, and have the option of experimenting with our diet as opposed to just following, a, you know, what our parents fed us when we were kids and, not, you know, uh, what school said, said we were supposed to eat. Uh, try it, like try different things, see, see how it makes you feel. And in terms of the mind control aspect of that, you know, it, I saw a lot of it from program to program, like each program had a kind of set meal structure, right? And I, now that I work in a long -term, term care facility, I'm actually being educated on why they do that. You know, like we yeah. have a four week menu and that's what, what they serve. And we serve that and we, we break it down in certain ways and puree and, and, and do these different things to do it in order to help them digest it better and help them you know, better um, utilize the, the material that we're giving them, therefore cutting down costs, making everything more efficient, keeping them healthy, alive, last longer, bringing in the money, but that, <laughs> that's the non-cynical version of that, keeping them alive and then, uh, you know, uh, hopefully making them have a better quality of life because they're getting the proper nutrients. And there's, you know, a lot of science behind all of this stuff, but it really is, you know, every resident in our building has their own meal plan. Yeah. Okay, so you said a couple of interesting things there. First of all, like I agree, I agree with you about like the adaptation periods to diets. Like it usually, like people if they don't, if they're not feeling better in a couple of days, or if they are not losing weight generally, right, or whatever, if that that's generally it, then they dump the diet. One of the things that was really interesting to me um, about the switch to the carnivore diet. The only way that it took me a little bit to get adapted, I'd say, is that for like the first week that I was on it, I didn't have quite as much energy for like cardiovascular exercise. Like it felt a little harder, but I didn't feel tired like outside of the exercise. It was just like my body hadn't quite figured out yet how to use it for more aggressive exercise. Um, and that lasted for one week. But for me, I felt what you're talking about in terms of like the, 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 ener the, the even energy level the for, uh, within 24 hours. Like it was exactly like you said, like it was bedtime. And like, I was like, holy fuck, I'm not tired at all. How am I gonna be able to sleep? But I closed my eyes and I went to sleep and, and I slept, you know? And um, I did have like for the first couple of weeks, sometimes I'm um, uh, waking up to go to the bathroom quite a bit in the middle of the night to, to pee, you know, like I, for some reason, like, I don't know if it was just, my body was using water differently or, or what was going on. And sometimes when I would wake up in the middle of the night, I'd have either a dry mouth or like a metallic tasting mouth, but that passed pretty quickly. Um, and then for me over time, I guess, and it, again, it has to be balanced with, have I done any like, oh, well, I did mostly carnivore, but I ate this little bit of shit. And so maybe I don't feel quite as amazing. Or it could also just be that sometimes you get really used to something. So you don't appreciate the, the novelty of how different it feels. Um, anymore. Um, but it, I think I've never had any other eating plan where I felt the difference that day. Well, I, that's not true. When I tried the vegan diet, the first day of the vegan diet, I fucking felt hungry. <laughs> I felt hungry and not satisfied, but it wasn't a particular feeling in my body of either more energy or less energy or feeling good or bad or losing weight or gaining weight, whatever, right? Like, you know, and the other thing with the carnivore diet is because you're really most, you're, I mean, you're eating a few variety of meats maybe, but you're not eating this vast variety of foods that you would normally eat. So like, it's pretty easy to tell what is making you feel good or what is not making you feel good, right? Um, and so that, that, that was kind of interesting, but I agree with you about like doing things in a cyclical sort of pattern, right? Like I'll kind of, 
and, and I've, I've talked to like a lot of people and you know some who like are like I have a guy that I've kind of befriended named Rob Stewart who I have I've had him on the show and he's an interesting guy in the sort of carnivore community like he's a skin health expert like he helps people use diet to clear like eczema and rosacea and psoriasis and all that kind of stuff and he first did it through being a vegan but then that left him with a lot of other health problems so then he became a carnivore and actually found it to be just as effective or more effective with a lot of his clients for for solving the same set of problems in a way but not creating other health issues afterwards right and he's an interesting guy but he's all about the cycling right like he like you know and he we kind of had a conversation about that where it's kind of like hit you know being sort of hard of hit the carnivore hard for a period of weeks and then take a week or two where maybe you bring in some carbs or some other things that you know sit okay with your body right and do that for a little bit and, and and during that period is actually where you can make a lot of your if you're a person like myself or yourself who likes to exercise like you can make that push to the next level then because you have two different energy sources coming in that your body knows how to use both of and if you're only using the carbohydrates that you know your body does well with it's not going to be a struggle to incorporate them right so he'll use that period to build his muscle or to try a new activity or if he has a project to do or something like that and then go back to the carnivore and then just kind of continue you know and every time he switches does a cycle he makes like one or two small changes to what he's doing to start to see what really works well and i think that's one of the things that whether you are vegan or carnivore or whatever everybody should start to consider their body as their own laboratory Right, like that's something that we all have the right to do by definition of being here is to experiment with our own body. It doesn't hurt anyone else, right? And you know for sure, right? When you're listening to somebody else give the reports on their experiment, you don't know if they have a bias in the outcome or if there was something that they didn't do right in their laboratory or, or whatever. But you know what you're doing with your body and you're allowed, you know what I mean? And it's not affecting anyone else. So I feel like that's a great, like, learning to before you start worrying about how you're going to like hack the simulation or hack the matrix or, or whatever like figure out how you hack your body first and get to know like on a pretty predictable one-to-one -one basis what doing this causes what do if you do this action it causes this if you do that action it causes that and then you can start to carry that out to some other things i think but like it's the best like test ground period is your body absolutely and you know in terms of you know, personal sovereignty, why wouldn't you be, you know, we, we talk a lot about taking back your soul, taking back your mind, but why wouldn't you want to do that with your body and just kind of share, you know, personally, and my own current experience. When I was young, I had, you know, really strong body, really strong soul. I did martial arts and my soul is what it was. And, and I knew it wasn't, I was developing my thought. I was developing my mind. And then for a while, I got kind of obsessed with developing my mind for a while. So I let my body go mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. reach an equilibrium between mind and soul, but not the body was then, you know, it's, it's whatever. It can do it. Like I, I'm this, why do I need that body? Mm -hmm. Now that I've finally brought myself back to that shape that I was in when I was younger and used to fight and practice martial arts, like what I call fighting shape, I finally feel the most clarity that, I should have and all of that stuff that I've even been trying to shut off for years comes back online almost as a reflex because yeah. I'm just that clear, just that in tune with things that it's, it's almost undeniable. It flows through me. I don't have to try it. So it's been really important to discover that because, you know, I, I, I thought I was okay for so long, you know, like my mind and my, my soul were, were right. I had everything balanced, I had everything in line. I thought I was good. I thought I was good. I thought I was good as I was going to get and everything was fine. And then I did this kind of as a hobby. And as it kind of started to come in or into line with the rest of things, that's when I started to notice, well, fuck, this is making me even more powerful. This is making me even more alert. This is making me even more ready to deal with things when they come. I'm, I'm less sad. I'm less angry. I'm less yeah. in fear of things that are going on because I feel more equipped to deal with life on a whole other level that I didn't feel like I was equipped to deal with it yesterday, you know, or not yesterday, literally, but you know. Yeah, no, basically yesterday, people are very confused about how much time is how much time. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with you about that. I mean, I, it's very similar for me. Like, I, you know, I think, um, obviously, with the gymnastics and stuff, I did all this physical stuff. And then, 
you sort of grow up, you do your thing, you start to have your set of issues and your problems. And, uh, you know, that maybe is a time where you're not keeping your body in such good a shape. And then you sort of have a come to moment. But then the first place you often go is the spiritual or like the, you know, trying to figure things out. And really it's a mental space and things don't really come back into balance until you're sort of doing both. Right. And it's a, it's one of the things that's sort of been um, frustrating for me about our community a lot. You know what I mean? There's like a lot of people that like, while they don't like that, like we're being poisoned with pesticides and GMOs and pharmaceutical drugs and stuff like that, they haven't gone and taken that next step into really taking ownership of their body by being incredibly physical. Right. And it's, I've gotten to a space where like, it's hard for me to take seriously someone who's afraid of a forced vaccination if they're not even gonna be able to make a run for it if they come to your door with the needle, right? Like it's hard for me to take that seriously. And, um, you know, and I, but at the same time, I also know that like, I wasn't at that space of awareness until I was. And there was a period of time where I was sitting in my room, just watching videos, eating candy, doing drugs, talking about all this poison that they're doing to us and whatever, and you know, not, not feeling like I had to explain for all the poisoning I was doing to myself and, and the not caring for the body. But no, I think when the body is fit, the things we know up here, like sync up perfectly with what we can do with our body. And it becomes like a seamless, like a Bruce Lee, like be like water, my friend kind of thing as opposed to struggling really hard to get everything in line with itself, right? Absolutely. And uh, just even the, <clears throat> you know, there's something in, in exercise called, called a mind muscle connection. <clears throat> so excuse me. Um, and you know, what's the word there? Connection. Right, so mm -hmm. you're developing connection. Mm -hmm. it's no different than developing like a mind to soul connection. It's no different than developing a heart to mind connection. It's no different than developing any other type of connection. It feels the same. The process is the same, and mm -hmm. learning to do so just makes you better at every other thing you ever learn. Right. Yeah. So it's just one other way that you can take control of your existence here, and practice discipline. And you know when you were talking there about <laughs> basically I, I i feel really frustrated myself because i feel like it's a irresponsibility mm -hmm. and i this phrase keeps repeating like humans are just very irresponsible mm -hmm. we don't want to take control of the problem we just want to complain about the problem <laughs> we just want to point at how we're being fucked over we don't want to go okay we're being fucked over but what can i take back from that what can i be yeah. like i don't have to do this i can't do this what I can control this, so I'm going to control that. Like, at least do what you can. You know, if you if you can't walk, at least crawl. Yeah, it, it, we gotta yeah. keep moving. So, um, it's really kind of irresponsible to be that person who's sitting there complaining about the world and complaining about you know the way things are, but at the same time not doing anything about it. At least even for themselves. And it starts there, and then we we echo out. But yeah, well, I also like if what you're what you're talking about here like if each person sort of took responsibility like in that really meaningful way for their body and that means doing the things to keep it healthy but also going okay this is my body i have the right to experiment with it the way that i want and to know what works and to know what makes me at my optimum and this that and the other thing then they wouldn't be able to fuck us over right and so like it isn't like you know it, it, you know and it's a lot harder to shift the whole world right and it's a lot harder to go i don't have enough power to change myself but somehow I'm going to pound on my keyboard enough to change the whole world. And then when all of that comes into alignment, then I'll be able to change myself. Whereas if each person just, oh, I'm going to change myself and all that other stuff, like a, a well person, well people wouldn't tolerate any of this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like if everyone, you know, if you go back to the root. If the problem is that all of this information was denied to us and we didn't get taught better and we didn't know better and we didn't do better because we didn't know better, well, now we know better and you're still not doing better, right? You might as well start now that you know and, and teach your friends and yeah. lead by example to those around you. And, you know, what's that stupid phrase, be the change that you want to see in the world, right? It's, uh, it is kind of that simple. And the benefit to discipline or the benefit to learning new skills or taking on new hobbies 
it's like learning another language. Every language you go to learn after you learn that language becomes easier to learn because now you have a bigger frame of reference for it. You have more tools to deal with whatever comes along next. So, you know, whether it's your body, your mind, or your soul, whatever your practice becomes, it makes other practices easier. If you learn one breathing method, learning Wim Hof doesn't seem as daunting because you've already learned one. Right? And the same thing here. We've, we've spent all this time learning all this stuff about the Anunnaki and the blah, 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 and the blah, blah, blah. And we've, we've done a really good job with it, right? But we can take all that energy and we can put it into bettering our world from within and then without. And, you know, you're talking to someone or I'm, I'm ta someone talking to you as someone who believes that this isn't even real and that we're in a matrix. And yet I still think that it's important for us to do this. So that's how important it is for us to do this. And yeah. how sure I am that if we had have done this, then we wouldn't have ended up where we are. But yeah, no, absolutely. I wanted to ask you about a couple of things that came up while you were speaking just during this period of time. So you said you've always had issues with sleep, right? And myself as well, like mostly sleep paralysis, um, which, you know, for the most part, really got better for me, A, definitely when I stopped doing drugs, um, but B, when I stopped consuming sugar, like every once in a while, I'll still have like a little minor episode, but nothing serious. Um, it, are you talking mostly about sleep paralysis or were you like a sleepwalker or what kind of stuff did you have going on in your sleep that has been resolved um, by some, by either by cleaning up your diet or by the carnivore diet in particular? A lot of insomnia. <clears throat> like a lot of just not being able to. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, sleep eating as well. Like I it's oh, yeah. sleep walking, but I would get up and I would raid things. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, my I, I live with roommates. So when I first moved in here, it was an issue. I got on this diet and kind of went away for a while. And then when I was switching off the diet a bit, it started to come back a bit. And even mm -hmm. now, when I, when I kind of fuck it up it, for a few days in a row, then it'll come back and I'll, I'll I'll sleep eat. And it, and it, so that was obviously tied to that too. I think that's again, sugar. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, nighttime is when we're getting blasted with all that, the, the kind of more nefarious frequencies, right? Yeah. Where they're the stuff that we're, we're, we're taking in for dream time and then whatnot, like all, all those frequencies are coming in at night. And so the programmable matter within our bodies, whether that's sugar or any other type of substance uh that's the time for it to really hit us mm -hmm. and, um so that would cause you know sleep paralysis that would cause a lot of issues that we have uh kind of collectively sleeping at night uh but yeah that switching that that diet definitely took that away from me like i've been a lot more restful I, maybe i shouldn't even blame the diet maybe i should think of something else but we don't need to go there <laughs> Most of the time, uh, some of the time before I, made that. I can guess what that is. <laughs> <laughs> go on a little bit of a personal rant I didn't need to go on. But um, yeah, I think like the, the diet I did start before that. So yeah, it was definitely, it's definitely a big, um, a big change. And there's also the learning process. And like a lot of vegans and vegetarians already understand this, that we, like, you have to learn how to supplement everything that you're not getting anymore. You have to learn, you know, what it is that you're taking from the food that you're eating in order to understand how the diet's actually working a lot of the time. Um, it's been really kind of fascinating with my roommate because he's, you know, he's, he's almost doing like the, the native style of like, I'm going to use all parts of the animal. You yeah. know, like go to a butcher and I'll get hearts and I'll get kidneys and I'll get everything and I'll learn how to eat bone and I'll learn how to eat everything so that I understand like, you know, that if I'm going to eat animals, then I want to understand it as well as I, I can. And I, I've, already done that so I don't need to do that now with the diet but I like that's an important thing too is like that learning process yeah again it's like learning another language because it is another language and then every language you go to learn from beyond that so you know take the step and 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 learn a new skill and then suddenly other things are just falling into line a little bit better too so that's why it's important to like we keep, we keep saying to you know never kind of let yourself sit on a plateau with anything just yeah. about anything in life you know if you get to a place where you're like okay i'm good now enjoy that for a while of course by all means enjoy that for a while but yeah. don't just stay there be like okay well where, where's the next challenge yeah mm -hmm. so what you were saying 
so I, I also had a lot of insomnia. Like, I, I mean, I've had periods of time, even up to like two weeks or more, even, I'm not talking about times on drugs, <laughs> so, right? Where I was unable to sleep for like, like I, you know, really extensive periods of time. And I have ideas about, you know, why that possibly was. But the sleep eating thing is fascinating. Like that is not, I mean, I have in my life, sometimes woken up in the middle of the night and been hungry, but it's been a very conscious thing and, and not eating some weird thing that I wouldn't normally eat necessarily, right? But both my step, my stepmother and my stepbrother were sleep eaters. And um, it was very odd because like, sometimes I, I would either be awake when they did this or I might wake up because I heard them and I would like go out into the kitchen and they're not there. They're just like, in the, like, like they'd be standing at the refrigerator doing it there, like not at the table or whatever. But my brother was at least eating things that were like in his normal realm of things to eat. But the, my stepmother, it was odd. Like she'd eat things like the children's cereal that she, she didn't like it, like cup chocolate Captain Crunch and stuff like that, or things she never ate in her waking life. And she'd be doing it like right there at the, at the uh, refrigerator, right? Just like taking the swig of milk. And it was very odd. And it was, I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen that before, but it was like, it was, it was, it's very weird to observe. That wasn't one that I had at least, not that I'm aware of. I've never had woken up in the morning and food not been there that should have been there or anything like that. Um, but that's an interesting one. There was also a lot of issues in my neighborhood that I grew up in with kids sleepwalking, which to me largely says that there was lots of kids that were wrapped up in the programs. But there was one kid who lived on the corner who is my, my sister and his sister were very friendly and whatnot. But um, he would wake up and walk around and one night he like woke up at our front door about to knock on the front door right it almost and I, I was very curious i mean at the time i didn't know what it was now in hindsight it was like was he coming to get, to get me for our for our uh, adventure for the evening kind of thing right <laughs> um you know so that that's an interesting thing um you also brought it to in terms of like the mind control and you were talking about how there was specific diets for specific programs or, or, or things like that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I have a very particular maybe idea, a way that I've tried to, I mean, I think that I have a different set of memories, a different kind of set of memories than you have from your childhood, because I think we were, even though we were probably involved in a lot of similar stuff, we were doing different things within that. And so, I think maybe like I have some more of certain kind of experiences because I was actually unknowingly in them, whereas you were aware of them, so you could, wouldn't experience them in the same way, right? Like in a different, it was just a different, uh, it's like the difference between being in the game and being the coach or something like that, or being the reporter, or, right? Um, and so how did you see diet used in various programs? And then, I, and then I'm going to say kind of what, what, what my observations were about that. Well, obviously, there's the um, the energetic property of food, which was a big thing, especially when we were younger. And a lot of the programs that we were in were based on things that were more spiritual or psychic than than physical. Um, and then when you were, uh, I don't. Obviously, it's more common for boys to get into more physical programs than it is for females, but um, but not this females. <laughs> but exactly, but but um, there are still very physical programs that females would get into yeah and and usually a lot of those very physical few uh programs had something that was like kind of tied to it i think the best example i can think of and the only time i ever asked for an explanation and got one was you know a certain water program where we were spending a lot of time underwater and holding our breaths for a long period of time mm -hmm. we were fed all seafood Mm -hmm. We were eating things that were capable of taking in, taking the pressure of being that deep. We were eating things that were capable of uh, producing oxygen from water, and we were eating things that, you know, had those benefits. And for long periods of time, again, like cellular growth, it kind of it happens in cycles, right? Like cellular regeneration, anyways, it happens in cycles. Like we have the whole seven-year cycle where you're pretty much a whole brand new person at the end of it, right? So there would be like periods of time leading up to things and then during it and then afterwards where you would continue these diets 
because it was making yourselves more similar to something mm -hmm. that was best suited for your environment. Yeah. And then because they know more than we do in the, in the mainstream world, they know that. They know that you literally are what you eat. And if you are going to exist in a certain environment, and that's why it seems to anthropologists that, you know, like the Eskimo example, they only eat meat and that their body processes it that way. And it's because that's all that's available. It's not necessarily it's that it's all that's available, but for their environment, that's what would make them the best. Think about it. You're eating other food that can survive in that same environment, right? So it, it just makes sense. And so again, with diets, um, it doesn't apply to us in today's modern society because we have all these amenities and whatnot, but I'm sure like your diet would be very much based on where you live, not just because that food is available there. Well, and I also think that nature knows that, you know, if you're going to live that close to the equator, then you're going to burn off a lot more water and you're going to need to eat a lot more fruit, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm sure that like nature understands those things as well. So as it tied into programs, that was the same thing was, you know, if you were doing something that required a lot of say spiritual energy, or they were going to try and take a lot of spiritual energy from you, then they would feed you stuff with a lot of spiritual energy in it. And the, like fresh, fresh organic fruits and vegetables, like picked straight off a tree. We used to get that, right? Mm -hmm. Things these, that they grew, they grow their own food down there. They have the artificial light to do it. And they would literally go take our dinner off trees at times and feed it to us. And that's a lot different than buying an apple at a grocery store. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, there's all those things that I'm saying can still apply to us now, or we can apply them to ourselves now, you know, like the environment that I live in, I can get a lot of energy from a lot of different places. I don't necessarily need to be taking it out of my food. Right. I actually have, I live in a major city mm -hmm. with way too much energy. Right? So I really don't need that extra energy to, to, to operate. I can, I can generate it just fine. So I don't necessarily need that type of energy. I need different materials in order to do what I do and function. And so I, I choose what I do based on that. And so I learned that through you know, observation mostly, that they were feeding us things that were relevant to what we were doing. So that's very interesting. Okay, so like the way this is like, these are the things that I've sort of figured out, right? Like I figured out that, um, that the first thing I started to pay attention to is that most people that I know who either know they were involved in projects and programs, or maybe I have a suspicion that they were, or they may have a suspicion that a lot of us were not permitted, our parents didn't let us eat sugar, right? Like, and it doesn't mean we never ate sugar, but it was something that we never ate at home right? Like no candy at home or anything like that. And um, yeah, like, and no sugar cereal, like none of that stuff. Like really, like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say we were fed a super perfectly clean, healthy diet, but there was an absolutely no candy, no junk food kind of policy. Um, and then I started to, as you were, you know, and then I start, you know, at a certain point it was like, okay, like I have a feeling that exactly what you're talking about. When we were doing like more psychic kind of activities, right? It was a lot of fruit, especially when you're a kid. Fruit's a better sell for kids than vegetables, right? You know what I mean? But also that, that what you're talking about, like there's nothing better for a little kid to go pick the thing right off the tree and eat it. And whether that was in a controlled setting, in an underground kind of thing, you grew up in a different kind of area than I did, or whether you were in a place where uh, above ground there was a, a natural sort of habitat where you could go around picking nuts and this and that, or where people's, even people in your neighborhood had a fruit on their trees and things like that. And so you thought you were playing, but that drive for that was kind of there. I went through, I, I would go through cycles with my eating where it would seem like either coming from me or being imposed, but more often coming from me, I would just want to eat the same thing every day for a period of time. And then all of a sudden it would switch. So that could be like, and it wasn't things that kids normally get into that with necessarily. It wasn't the type of like some kids will get into just wanting to eat macaroni and cheese or peanut butter and jelly or whatever. It wasn't that. Right. So I did have that notice. And then I also at a certain point, like when there'd be a period where I was doing a lot of exercise, well, some of them I think were exercises and some were presented as exercises, even though they may have been more of a real thing. A lot of exercises that were like um, hum hunger games kind of activities, 
right? Like a lot of uh, chase the maiden and, and, you know, run for your life kind of, you know, whatever, that there'd be a lot of meat eating at those periods of times in my life. Like suddenly my dad was barbecuing ribs like almost every night, right? You know, or whatever, or, um, you know, there was like a lot of hamburger eating going on or, or whatever it is, right? And um, so, but I had not thought about the seafood in relation to the underwater breathing before. And, and now that you say that, like, I remember this particular period of time where it was like all I was fucking getting first at school or at camp was tuna fish, right? Like tuna fish. And it's like, okay, kids like that. That's a seafood that they'll eat, right? Like, it is, you know, they may try and get you to eat certain things that you don't want to eat, but I felt like that was always more saved for really uh, unsavory activities, not so much in your daily diet. But so they would find the ones that you would eat. And so for a kid, that would be tuna fish and fish and chips or, you know, things like that that a kid might take. But also there was a few times, maybe it was more than a few, but in your head as a kid, it's hard to separate what was like multiple times and what was just one or two really meaningful times where um, my dad would bring me my dinner in the car when he picked me up from gym. And it would be like salmon and I fucking hated salmon but he would make me eat it, which is not something my dad was, I didn't have a lot of rules when I was a kid. It wasn't like, you're, you better eat this or you know whatever, it's gonna be your breakfast the next morning. There was not a lot of that in my house, but for some reason, when it was the salmon for dinner, it was like, you have to eat this and you can't go to your room or you can't go to sleep until you eat it. And I could never quite understand why, because that didn't exist with other dinners, right? So it wasn't like a, um, a tool that my parents used to discipline me, right? But it was like, you have to eat the fucking fish, right? And, and, and if you needed gills the next day or that week or whatever, right? Then it goes to sort of um, what you were saying. And then I also noticed that um, while I didn't get candy or junk food at home, um, there was certain places I always got it right? It, they seemed like odd places sometimes to get it, right? Um, and like even at the summer camp, like I remember that like there would be, I would not ever have candy there during the day, right? But sometimes I'd get a piece of candy before I went home, right? And the kid might think of that as a reward, but what I understand now is no, that was actually the mind eraser. That was actually like the, right? So like I, you know, I do all my activities early in the day in, you know, the camp, it seemed like that was both at camp and at school, there was a lot of separating of myself or maybe one or two other kids from the rest of the group, right? And then later after we had rejoined, it would be time at the pool or something like that. And then the candy and then go home, that kind of thing. And then um, also like when I went to my mother's house, when I, after my parents got divorced, it was like unlimited junk food at my mother's house. And that wasn't um, not something that she normally ate, nor did it feel like it was something that, like uh, she was trying to do to like um, get us to like her or anything like that. It was almost more seemed like um, like it was there to create a certain mind state, right? Kind of thing. Um, what do you think about all that stuff? And then I have something else I want to say about sugar and sleep based on something you brought up. Well, yeah, I mean like certain routine patterns and stuff like that were used as tools uh, not i i didn't have too much of that i mean i was allowed sugar when they really wanted me under control right so i was um i would always go to a an aunt's house my aunt was famous for having a whole drawer full of chocolate bars at her house yeah. you know and like cans of pop stacked up to the ceiling you know you could uh get a lot of sugar there and that was a big part of it was they liked it when I was all jacked up on sugar because they could use their frequency stuff that I hadn't yep. figured out yet. Yep. Back when I was really young. Um, I'm kind of against me. So yeah, it's also, you know, that, that happy meal on the way home. Yep, um, the, oh, the happy meal on the way home was a big one. Yep. That's, that's just regular like psychological programming or like, you know, it's, it's pretty, they're doing it to every kid really, but <laughs> with, with the, with the toy and the happy meal type thing, but uh, yeah. on the deeper level for us, that's why it was like it such was, a big deal. When it, we was, were it was never the toy for us. Like the toy yeah. wasn't what the issue was with the, it no, never for me. The, the happy meal to begin with, because it wasn't regular for us. Right. It was, yeah. you know, a lot of the other kids who wanted the toy and the happy meal got the garbage food at home still, you know, yeah. not the garbage food, the, the junk food at home. Yeah. 
yeah. for, I first had, I had, I mean, like that was another thing. Like my dad never took me to McDonald's but on the one night a week. My mom would pick me up from gymnastics. Like a lot of times it was to McDonald's or, or sometimes like what's weird is, so that's something that carried over. And like later as an adult, like even before I was like super into healthy eating, like I am now, I had a reasonable diet at some point as an adult, but because I was using a lot of drugs, sometimes that would get off into other things. And I had this period of time where like, whenever I had been up for an extended period of time on drugs, now my recall of some of those times is probably not particularly accurate. Um, but like when I would be starting to come down or like going home or something like that, even though like I had been out of eating McDonald's for years and years and years, suddenly I was wanting to stop at the McDonald's on the way home and eat a Happy Meal, which to me, was, in hindsight, is the signifier that there was something deeper going on than just the drug use in some ways. Um, but when I first read um, Elisa E's books, I don't know if you've ever read her books. Have you read her books? No. Oh, uh, go, read her books. <laughs> it's an interesting read because like as much stuff as like you or I may have been able to have sussed up from our past on our own, it'll bring up some shit that you'd be like, holy shit, right? Um, she talked about every time she was on the way back from uh, a task, as she calls it, right? And this being as an adult and, and, and not a super young adult, right? That she would stop for McDonald's french fries kind of on the way back in, right? Um, and if you think about like the way that those things smell and taste, there's such like a particular thing with it. And that goes for everybody, but particularly for somebody who doesn't get it very often and then is in a very, let's say heightened hormonal state after certain activities that like it's 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 very um it's a different experience even than it is for the normal person well yeah it's like you, you attach things right it's like a bonding it's a, a smell is very like biggest thing attached to memory and uh, that's why a lot of those things that they used such as that had a very strong smell like something like a really sour candy Mm -hmm. you know, french yep. fries something like that right and um that's why is it's it's kind of like electroshock therapy if you were like or training a dog you know with a mm -hmm. with a, a electro a electric fence is you know every time you go you get that shock it's mm -hmm. the opposite of that every time you do it you get that relief like that 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 high more or yep. less and it, it becomes attached to it. So they start doing that to us when we're kids so that when we're adults, we just continue doing it to ourselves. We associate the experience with the reward at the end of it. And then that reward, it's kind of like, and you've done drugs, you understand, you like the, the shower at the end of your Coke binge. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Like brushing, <laughs> your, brushing your teeth after ecstasy, <laughs> you know, like uh, something like that where like, it's just like, oh, okay now i'm back to normal it's like the demarcation between one phase and the other phase exactly. it doesn't even necessarily mean that you're fully back it's just you're now it's like when you go from being like in the stadium like into the hallway into the locker room right there's like significant phases right and then you leave the locker room and you go home right yeah it's conditioning but the proper word for this form of conditioning is ritualistic right like it's, it's a ritual thing yeah they, they create the ritual you perpetuate the ritual later in life and that's what keeps you bonded to the experience <clears throat> yeah it's interesting that's you brought up the sour candy too right because those are like that i went through a phase where i just could not get a candy sour enough to accomplish whatever the fuck it is i was trying to accomplish with it right like i don't those aren't anywhere near my favorite kinds of candy Right. And like, I would gotten to the point with some of these candies where like my tongue was raw, like, right. Like it, like it, like, and it wasn't, um, and it seemed to me that the popularization of sour candies came at a particular point when there had been a shift from like what I would t call like more of an analog mind control to more of a digital mind control. And the sour candy seemed to come along with that. Am I right on that? Yep. It's a little bit more of a shock to the nervous system. Yeah like a heightened shock with a little bit more electric i guess uh like a little bit similar to getting zapped yeah uh, the, the effect that a sour sweetness would have over a your regular sweet right? yeah yeah um you said something before about like the sugar like before bed while you're sleeping and whatnot I, and i want to address that in a second but even just the digestion of food is a psychedelic process of sorts, right? And um, 
a lot of people who have like night terrors and nightmares and stuff like that, if you really dig into like esoteric nutrition and esoteric anatomy, actually like when people are having trouble digesting food or, or food that they may think is good for them that actually isn't, like that could be the creation, the creator of some of these night terror kinds of dreams where animal foods, uh, not that there's not any psychedelic aspect to the digestion of that, but it's, it's easier for our body to digest. So it doesn't have to have as like outlandish of an experience to sort of assimilate it. And that was kind of an interesting thing to, to understand food as like, like, you know, the original sort of psychedelic experience, right? And then you have sugar come in, which is not necessarily hard to digest, like simple sugars like candy, what you're talking about, but all these other things break down to sugars as well. One of the things you were talking about, like that's the great time for the programming because that's when all of the nefarious frequencies are abound and it's an odd time anyway, energetically. Um, but how familiar are you with like the lily wave stuff? Um, I, I don't like dream modification stuff like that or? So lily waves are like, if you live in a house that has like electricity that is run from a grid, basically you have this dirty electricity that has what's called lily waves in your walls. These lily waves oh, yeah. were invented by the same person, John Lilly, who came up with our deprivation tanks and all this other kind of stuff, right? So have you ever had that experience? And for a long time, I associated my ability to, well, I still associate my ability to see it and recognize it as having been something that I was only able to achieve through like the heightened state of drugs on a certain level, but it's definitely there. And what you're talking about with the sugar before bed and that being your biggest programming time. So the lily waves, like I would used to, like after being up for a couple of days, I'd like lay back in my bed and I was kind of waiting to fall asleep. Like I was like tired enough, I was coming down, but I wasn't quite there to fall asleep yet. And I started to notice like out of the vents in the wall and out of the like sockets, the plugs and stuff, that there was little stuff that looked almost like part of black particle tech, like nanotech. And my cat seemed to see it too, right? Like we'd be sitting there on the bed looking at the same thing. And it seemed to be sort of like coming away from the walls, almost as if coming towards me. And it wasn't like something scary. I'm not saying it formed into entity faces, but it was definitely this stuff that was like coming out of these spaces. And then when I learned about lily waves from somebody i was like oh maybe that's what i was seeing and i just normally in your normal state you can't quite see it and what's interesting about i'll send you this article um so that you can check it out sometime because it might be pretty it might be uh pretty meaningful to you there's probably a lot of stuff in there that would be interesting for you to look at and understand but there's a particular part let me see if i can find it um uh you know, he's, and of course, Lily was into with the NIH and the Navy and all that kind of stuff. Let me see if I can find the little part where it talks about sugar. Hmm. Well, it talks about lily waves and their ability to affect, directly affect water molecules, right? But it also, um, it says here, here we go. If a molecule is targeted, uh, uh, is targeted by a wave that resonates at the same frequency as that molecule, the molecule will explode. Sugar is a crystal and crystals when stressed, broken or deformed release an electric and electromagnetic charge. This is known as tri tri triboluminescence. The effect of an exploding sugar crystal is quite damaging to the mind and brain. It creates extreme confusion, dizziness and also a state best described as lack of awareness or apathy. Lily wave frequency is a secret military application. It is known as the madness frequency. And then there's like another little part down here that talks about how, you know, it doesn't have to be like even fr like, you know, freshly consumed sugar. It can just, the, the, your blood sugar in general, right? If there's over, and my theory has always been <coughs> over five grams of sugar in the blood, hence the coding of 5G, right? Kind of thing. It's a similar kind of application that, and actually five grams is your resting blood sugar if you haven't consumed anything that has anything in that. So, um, it's basically these lily waves would work hand in glove with the sugar in our body to create exactly what you're talking about. And, and um, to my mind, it's fascinating that we have the same person that gave us these tanks where we would often hold our breath, right? Whether, I mean, we had tanks that had water in them and ones that didn't, um, but this is the guy who had the flipper TV show and the anechoic chambers and then these waves 
and whatnot. And, and it's almost like he was a one-stop shop for all the technology that you needed for, you know, a nice little installation, uh, you know, or whatever it was. So I hadn't really thought about it in terms of so much the sugar, how it affected me when I was sleeping. I guess I always thought of it in terms of like creating um, time events for myself when I was awake and sort of on a certain level, like hopped up on sugar. But that's an interesting idea that really, you know, just that whatever's going on in that sleep phase with the amount of blood sugar, it's just blood that's in your sugar. I hadn't really, I mean, I used to have all these trips out to buy candy in the middle of the night that I didn't quite understand. Um, and then wake up in the morning sometimes and not really be kind of clear on how that all had gone down. But um, yeah, interesting. I'll send you the article on the lily waves. It's kind of interesting. Anything crystal can store memory. Anything that's crystalline could be broke down into a uh, liquid can be used to transmit it, right? So mm -hmm. a good way to, you know, with the more targeted type of programming or uh, like that's why I brought up dream manipulation because it's a lot of what they were using it for. Yeah. Um, just inceptions, like putting thoughts in your head, things like that. They can do a lot of that using the combination of like, so I, what you're saying the lily waves I've always just seen is like stagnant energy. It's here and that's what radio waves are based on as well. And that's, you know, how they've manipulated it for forever. Obviously 5G is a more advanced form of control over that type of stuff. And that works hand in hand with this crystal and that we're all in consuming called sugar and um, becomes the programmable matter. Right. And that's the, the programmable part of it. Again, you are what you eat and your matter becomes mm -hmm. what you are. And therefore, you know, it's the same thing. If you ever lose a lot of fat, you're going to start having these weird memories. Yeah. Right. Like when you start burning through fat, you start having memories of like, you know, not even just the food that you ate, but like where you ate it and who you were with or the like feelings that you went through or like periods of time that you've gone through. Like everybody who loses a lot of fat, they, they experience these things. And I've experienced it too. And it's uh, because like these cells are holding memory, right? And these cells were created in a certain environment and they have the memory of that environment still so when they break down yeah that memory all gets released back into you and you yep. take it in somehow and sugar does the same thing so they can program the sugar with thoughts and memories and yeah. feelings and all of this stuff and then have that break down and explode within you and you end up taking on the feeling that they programmed it well that. that's what's so interesting when these so I think all the lily wave does, like you just said, you think of it as like certain ever present kinds of stuff there. I think all the lily wave does is like when you have a home or a modern structure, sort of like local, keep it, make sure that it's like, like uh, sort of centers it in the area, right? Kind of thing as opposed to be all around you. It's directly being sort of pumped into these kind of structures or, or, or being, you know, dealt with there. Um, these crystal explosion explosions of things, right? So like with the programmable matter, and then there's this explosion based on the frequencies, it distributes it throughout your body so that you don't necessarily have a cohesive linear account necessarily of what happened. You have all these broken little pieces that sort of go everywhere and they're assimilated in. And especially if you're consuming a fair amount of sugar, that sugar does turn to fat and that's a much better store. Like the sugar is easier to program than the fat, but the fat stores it better. And so I hadn't really thought about it that way, but when I stopped eating sugar, like that's when a lot of my memories started coming back. But the other thing that went along with that is I never was really overweight, but I had definitely like been out of shape and had like a little layer of fat that I hadn't really necessarily had before. So some of that really old stuff that was coming back, that's interesting that it may have you know, sort of been as I lost the fat, it was really that as opposed to just becoming more clear from having the, the, the sugar not part of my diet. I mean, both things probably, but I hadn't thought about it in terms of the fat. But it is interesting, like when I work with people who are losing a lot of fat, I do prepare them for the fact that like it is stored in their, um, you know, their, their trauma is stored in the fat. So they may have some emotional upsets that come. And I guess I just hadn't thought about that one in terms of myself because I had always associated it more with sugar. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a interesting thing that, you know, we we have all this information kind of available to us in various places. It's just not all broken down into like one way in which relates to us as individuals. We know how like energy and crystals work. We know how um, water and energy and memory work. We know how, you know, 
um, calcium as an example. Yeah, which is, calcium's an interesting one. Exactly, and like yeah. all of these different minerals that we are made up of, right? Yeah. But we don't really stop to think about the fact that we are made up of those things, right? And, um, you know, that's why, you know, a lot of people associate depression with weight gain is because, you know, it's not just that you're overeating, it's actually that your metabolism is going, eh, fuck it. <laughs> you know, and like yeah. you're, 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 all your insides are doing that, and then you overeat, and then it doesn't know how you don't know how to deal with it, and then you start to get better, and you you keep falling back into your depression because why you're you're burning those memories back out. You don't even know that you're doing it. Whereas like all of this education mixed with a little bit of discipline, we could all be you know in a, in a better spot for ourselves. But that's what the occult was all about, right? Was to try and make it so that we weren't in a good spot. And we, you know, uh, are sick and we aren't well and we can't handle shit. But uh, again, we can take it all back now. Uh, yeah, we, I think we've just, you know, it's not, this conversation was not necessarily about, oh, everybody should try carnivore as the solution to some of this kind of stuff. It's more, I, I mean, I think the place that I'm at is that, you know, like, there's not a thing that works for every situation. So you have to be flexible in terms of like, you know, the carnivore diet may be working great for you for a certain period of time. And then something about your life circumstance changes. Maybe you move from being in the city to out in the country, or you have a different kind of job and you need to switch it. But the point is, is that like, like you need to do that. Like, right. Like you need to take responsibility for like, recognizing these things within your own body and figuring out what works for you. And then once you figure out what works for you, also know that what's working now may, you know, you could like may work for a long time, but may some, at some point not work. And then you're going to have to make a shift again and starting to develop that muscle of like flexibility and adaptability is really important as well. Um, and these are things, I don't know, I feel like they're super helpful partly just because like when you have that good control, of your body and you figured out like a way of eating that works well for you it really helps with the emotional ups and downs it makes you um less susceptible to whatever kind of mind control is trying to be applied to you even though we've talked here about like you know that certain diets were used for certain conditions in the body like all technologies can be work can work sort of the other way as well and if you know that a certain scenario is coming at you there's certain way of eating that's going to help you through that and especially if you approach it with like awareness and consciousness, then, you know, um, it can be really helpful. So that was kind of the, the purpose of this. We're going to switch over and go over to the patron section and have some conversation about Shane's latest works. But before we go, did you want to say anything else about the topic to the people? Yeah, not really, I guess. Um, I was thinking of something there, but I lost it. We're good. We're good? Okay, cool. <laughs> Tell, you can find, uh, is everything right now on your The Runer Author YouTube channel or is there any place else where you're doing work right now? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, just there and the uh, best way to know what I'm putting there is either Twitter at The Runer Author or um, Facebook. There's The Runer Author page on Facebook. Cool. All right. We're going to see you guys in a few minutes. You can join us at uh, patreon.com forward slash off planet media for the rest. See you there. Bye.